I want you to picture this. You're on the couch, it's 10 p.m., popcorn in one hand, remote on the other, you tap play and... Behind that two-note chord hides one of the most aggressive, battle-tested cloud architectures on planet Earth. And tonight, we're sneaking backstage to see how Hollywood ends up on your couch, why Netflix literally breaks its own toys, and what happens when a llama chews through a fiber line in Peru. True story. Allegedly. For architects and engineers, every step here holds lessons about scale, about resilience, and how to design systems that survive chaos. My name is Ilyas, I'm a senior cloud architect. Now let's do this. So Hollywood sends Netflix monster-sized video masters. We're talking terabytes per film, 4K resolution, HDR color profiles, multi-channel Dolby, audio systems, and these land in AWS is three buckets obviously, the world's most battle-tested infinite hard drive. From there, Netflix spins up a fleet of EC2 GPU boxes running a Forks FFmpeg, the GOAT. For every title, they bake around 50 renditions, um, H.264, H.265, VP9, AV1, Dolby Vision, with bit rates that range from 100 kilobytes, we're talking old 3G systems, to 25 megabytes, your Dolby Atmos home cinema. Why? Well, because your gigabytes fiber in Austin, Texas doesn't look like someone's 4G phone in Nairobi, Kenya. Although I've never been to Nairobi, Kenya, I'm just saying. Each version is then sliced into tiny chunks, tiny one to four seconds chunks. Think of it like cutting a baguette into slices so that the player can grab just the right piece instead of choking on the whole loaf of bread. Now here's the clever bit. Not every slice makes the cut. Machine learning models use a video multi-method assessment fusion to grade every little segment and then it scores them. So anything below an 80 score is thrown out or re-encoded per title and sometimes even per shot parameters. And I'm saying this is the clever bit because imagine a dark scene. So you probably want to pass different parameters to encode that specific dark scene parameters that are different than what would normally be used to encode a bright scene. And finally, Netflix builds Dash and HLS manifests. And think of a manifest as a treasure map that tells your player Here's every possible chunk. Pick the best one given your bandwidth, your device decoders, and even your battery level. What a tremendous feat of engineering that was. And we haven't even scratched the surface. I mean, no wonder why Netflix engineers are paid above $1 million a year. For us regular people, we can at least learn from how Netflix pre-computes every single version upfront. So your device never wastes time in coding on the fly. That's why the video starts almost instantly. Sadly, businesses still refuse to adopt this concept of pre-computing. If you're generating a feed, a homepage, a profile page, chances are your front-end still makes back-end calls that then make SQL joins on the fly while the customer is waiting. And then someone comes along and says, hey, we need GraphQL. No, you don't. You need to pre-compute your data and store it probably in a DynamoDB table ready to be consumed by the front end in one query using like a customer ID, for example. But you know what? That requires you to adopt an event-driven architecture, introduce the eventual consistency to your system. And people are usually lazy and they just want to keep the status quo and they just prefer to keep throwing money at the problem, purchasing more powerful EC2s for their database clusters. But don't be that guy, please. Instagram pre-computes its feed for you. TikTok does it. Facebook does it. And now you know that Netflix does it as well. Every company that cares about latency, aka user experience, does it. So just do it already. All right, encoding solve the what to serve. Now let's tackle the where. Shipping bits across transoceanic cables for every user would bankrupt both Netflix and your ISP. So Netflix built its own delivery network and then gave it away. They shipped custom-built servers called OCAs directly into ISP networks, into ISP's buildings. These boxes aren't toys. We're talking network interfaces that handle hundreds of gigabytes per second. And for the OS, they're running a stripped-down FreeBSD with a fine-tuned Nginx. Now, there are 
over 18,000 boxes deployed worldwide. Result is 95% of Netflix traffic never leaves the ISP's own network. And it does so because of another beauty of engineering, a Spark job that trains nightly on global watch trends, preloading tomorrow's likely hits into the right city before breakfast. This means that on release day, Stranger Things is already sitting like literally three hops from your couch, like literally maybe two, three kilometers from your house. But the magic is not just hardware. Every Netflix player continuously probes your bandwidth. It's like a kid asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? So if your Wi-Fi stutters, it gracefully downgrades the next chunk. And if it clears up, well, the quality uh, slowly climbs back up. You know, majority of companies still operate from one region, one AZ, and still think that disaster recovery is too expensive until they have a disaster, mind you. But Netflix said all this is still not enough. So they built a failover path in the chance a, a server cluster melts or that, you know, that Peruvian llama gets hungry again. So your player will reroute to a secondary OCA, then only as last resort to Amazon CloudFront. But you'll never even notice. All these things happen behind the scene. And so by owning the critical path, Netflix controls both performance and costs. ISPs save on transit fees, users get smoother streams, and Netflix moves 15% of the world downstream internet traffic, just like that. But it's not all roses. Um, this lesson of owning the critical path can sometimes backfire, especially if you're a startup. You know, just, just use a managed service. Don't overcomplicate things. Make it work, make it right, make it fast. But once your model is proven, once you're making money, that's when you have to start thinking about vertical integration. While you binge Wednesday, Netflix binge listens to you. Every click, every pause, rewind, every buffering event is firehosed into Kafka topics. Yes, it sounds excessive. Until you realize Netflix is coordinating hundreds of millions of users across continents in real time. Building a feature for one user, extremely easy. Building it so uh, it works for everyone, securely, resiliently, maintainably for decades, that's the actual challenge. This topic captures playback, device telemetry, UI experiments, and even energy-saving data for mobile. Brooklyn, a system developed by LinkedIn, replicates topics across regions in under one second. And Apache Flint jobs join these events with show metadata like title ID, cohort flags, median, end-to-end -end latency, 380 milliseconds. I know websites takes five times that just to load their homepage. This masterpiece of engineering produces many benefits for us consumers, such as real-time personalizations. You know, the, the home screen can reshuffle artwork in under two minutes after a new trend signal. From a fraud detection perspective, the shared account heuristics fire web authentication challenges in under 10 seconds. And if a surprise soccer finale spikes load in Brazil, an event triggers extra EC2 capacity zones before things spoil over. The main takeaway here for me is that you have to treat telemetry like a product. User interactions aren't logs. They are, you have to treat them as input to the UX you see seconds later. Think about this. Netflix does not just observe it reacts while you're still watching. It doesn't take them stand-ups and sprints and ceremonies to make a change. They react while you are watching. That's the difference between insight and impact. Events age quickly, but insights last forever. So where do petabytes go to retire yet stay queryable in seconds. And by the way, dissecting Netflix data lake could be a whole episode of its own, but I just want to sketch uh, the map for now. S3 is obviously the lake. Durable, cheap, near infinite. Apache Iceberg provides asset transactions, so the same table works for batch and stream. Schema evolutions and time travels, so analysts can say, run this query as of the morning squid game drops and for the query engines no big surprises there trino formerly presto a project developed at facebook uh, for interactive 
ad hoc SQL queries, Spark on EMR for monster ETLs, again, no surprises, and Flink for real-time streams, aka continuous writes back into Iceberg. So we have same table, three modes of compute, zero data copy. I mean, the more I dig into this, the more I marvel at the lengths this company goes to in order to provide seamless experience for their users. It's just amazing. They also use Redshift and Druid and these power dashboards for finance, for studio KPIs. But Netflix has been shifting towards Tableau on top of Iceberg snapshots. Possibly a political move because Salesforce owns Tableau and Salesforce has been trying to get into uh, the streaming game for a while. Politics or not, I hear Tableau's new Arrow flight connector is the bomb, but I haven't had a chance to use it yet. So maybe some of you will educate me on this uh, in the comments. So the main takeaway here is decouple storage from compute and you gain price leverage over the hyperscaler. I mean, don't think for a second that AWS is charging Netflix the same public price and they're charging you or I. Uh, this also gives your company uh, the freedom to swap engines tomorrow if you wish so. No lock-in. But all this brilliance dies the moment one single region implodes. Unless you practice that implosion daily. Enter chaos engineering. And you would bring this proposal within literally any other company in the world, they'd laugh at you. But somehow, someone went to their manager with the idea of terminating critical servers during business hours, and he was like, best idea ever, let's just do it. And Chaos Monkey was born. Random EC2 terminations during office hours. Yeah, brilliant. But then someone else, probably jealous of the first guy, was like, boss, I have a better idea. Let's terminate entire AWS regions. And Netflix calls this Chaos Kong. And it means DevOps teams now inject latency and other shenanigans to simulate region-wide outages. Legend says that Netflix once failed over from US East 1 to US West 2 during lunchtime with zero tweets noticing. But if we learned anything from Netflix, is they go the extra, extra mile. In this case, organizing game days. And these are organized live action drills where engineers fight outages. This is like your fire drills that you do in your building, but for distributed systems. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm joking, but I have nothing but admiration for this level of professionalism. Failure is guaranteed. That is why redundancy is a thing in engineering. So let's just train engineers to handle problems during daylight to prevent 3 a.m. outages. Brilliant. Perfect 5 out of 7 score. Let's revisit what we've learned so far. Own the critical path. Netflix bought the CDN problem instead of outsourcing it. Build means buy plus customize. They always start with an open source like Kafka, Cassandra. Then they patch or fork it to meet scale. Kafka is good. Kafka with Netflix patches is Michelin star. Purpose built everything. Write database, write workflow for each job. And this avoids the one size fits all uh, bottleneck that a lot of companies deal with. And engineer for failures. Chaos is not a stunt. It's a daily discipline. So you have to break things on purpose so customers never notice accidents. And finally, use data as leverage. Real-time telemetry loops directly influence UX capacity and content decisions. If you're still here, smash that like button so the algorithm knows this is your jam and you also make my day. Subscribe for part three and tell me in the comments about which Netflix component should get its own deep dive. My name is Ilyas. Until next time, peace out.